Good morning. It is Monday, January the 7th, and this is The Drill. And uh, this is Ron, your, only, your host, the only true conservative in the United States of America today, because I'm the only one that makes the presumption for the status quo, speaking to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers. So from the Politico, Dems livid after Tlaib vows to impeach the mf -er. Party leaders fear such explosive talk only gives ammunition to the GOP. There's a picture of her in the... Uh, the um, caption reads, House Democrats largely do agree on one thing. Comments like Rep. Rashida Tla Tlaib's aren't helpful. House Democrats are furious that an incoming freshman's expletive riddled statement about impeaching Donald Trump has suddenly upended their carefully crafted rhetoric on their plans to take on the president. Speaker Nancy Pelosi and other top Democrats have long argued that impeachment is a last resort that would come at the end of an exhaustive oversight and investigations. But on the second day of the new Congress, the news was jammed with the talk of Rep. Rashida Tlaib of Michigan, who told a crowd of progressive activists to Thursday night uh, Thursday night that, quote, we're going to impeach the mf -er, unquote. Rank-and-file Democrats, immediately fearful of the damage that comment could cause, unloaded on their new colleague Friday morning. Republicans, they argued, would hold it up as proof that Democrats are playing politics rather than pursuing genuine oversight of the president, even if the GOP never showed interest in investigating Trump's scandals while it was in power. Mueller, quote, Mueller hasn't even produced his report yet, unquote, says Rob, Rep. Ron Kine, Democrat of Wisconsin, referring to special counsel Robert Mueller's Russia probe. Quote, people should cool their jets a little bit, let the prosecutors do their job, and finish the investigation, unquote. Quote, inappropriate, unquote, added Jim Costa, Democrat from California. Quote, as elected officials, I think we should be expected to set a high bar. It's not helpful, unquote. So um, her, Miss Tlaib's comments were typical left-wing, because you got to, again, in the party, the Democrat party, you got to divide between Democrats and socialists. Uh, the Democrats are interested in doing things. Those are the ones that you're hearing from uh, that, are, that are playing down the statement and criticizing it because uh, they want to go through and use the law and let the investigation go where it goes and et cetera. Like they said, you, after exhaustive investigations and then as a last resort, uh, you resort to impeachment. Also, well, anyways, um, so those are the Democrats. Miss Tlaib is being, at least being, socialistic. She's not a Democrat. She's a socialist. Uh, she is somebody that is a like a bomb thrower, uh, thinks of herself as a revolutionary. So she's going to go in and stir the pot. She's going to create trouble. And she's going to do so by acting first and thinking later. Because I'm certain if this... A representative from Michigan had thought about it before she made her statement, she wouldn't have said it, or at least she wouldn't have put it in those terms. But that's the problem with what's known as activism. Activism is the idea that you act first, think later. In other words, act impulsively. You get an impulse, go do something, and then rationalize your behavior. Now, when Miss Tlaib was confronted by the news people outside of the Capitol after she made the, her remark, uh, she refused to even rationalize the statement. She just uh, uh, literally, uh, the, the way the news people put it, fled the scene, uh, ran away and, and got into a waiting car and uh, left the area. But uh, again, the point is that she's being an activist, she's being a socialist, and uh, she's upsetting the Democrats, the true Democrats that are uh, more interested in, um, that really have no desire to destroy the country, that have really no desire to um, revolutionize the country. They want to make, see changes made, yes, but they're not uh, interested in the kind of radical change that representatives like Ms. Tlaib and uh, the representative, uh, that lady representative from New York have in mind. So, but again, that's, this is what happens when you're an activist. You go out and you act impulsively and then you rationalize. And so you always end up in a situation where, uh, you're always in a jam. Somebody is always, 
uh, well, what did you mean by that statement? And um, this is a, the same kind of situation that the president gets himself into sometimes when he makes impulsive remarks, and then he gets called on the carpet for it, and it gets a little bit awkward. Now, fortunately for him, he has been able, th the events have turned out to be on his side. For instance, when he came out and blurted out that uh, the Obama administration was spying on him when he was a candidate, everybody laughed at it and thought he was uh, going mad. But it turned out that there was more substance to that comment than anybody really knew. So, again, um, he has been fortunate that many times when he makes uh, these uh, what sound like off-the-wall remarks and off-the-wall statements, uh, if events, subsequent events, prove him right, at least to a degree. So, um, but uh, the other thing that I wanted to uh, speak about on my little monologue here is Senator, um, the senator from uh, New Hampshire... Uh, I believe it's for, she's from New Hampshire, Senator Warren. That's who I was looking for. So Senator Warren, and I wanted to, to, to draw some conclusions about what happened with Senator Warren from beginning to end. So Senator Warren comes out at some point a few years ago and says that uh, makes this claim that she was a, a tribal person, that she had some tribal blood in her, and that she was able to go to Harvard as a minority rather than as a uh, white woman. So um, then uh, the president made light of that, referred to her as Pocahontas. And of course, her response, because part of what the left does when they make these kinds of statements is they're baiting. They're baiting the GOP. They're baiting Republicans into coming out and making a rash statement so that then uh, the Democrat, the socialist, uh, can come out and club them over the head with their own words. And uh, Senator Warren tried to do that with uh, Donald Trump. And it works, but it only works on people that are easily intimidated. Unfortunately for her, President Trump is not easily intimidated. So uh, he didn't back down. He kept referring to her as Pocahontas. He finally came out and dared her to take a, a DNA test. And uh, she realized, I guess, at some point that um, sh her political future was now kind of... Uh, you know, hanging in the balance, so to speak, that she, it was time for her to either put up or shut up. And so she went ahead and took the test. And as soon as she took the test, she exposed herself as a liar. Because when she came out and claimed that she was, had tribal blood in her, she claimed that as a statement of certainty. When she takes the test, she's saying, well, actually, I don't know. But she was hoping to take the test that maybe some of her blood would be uh, tribal and uh, therefore she could uh, come right back to the president and uh, shut him up, so to speak. Well, it turned out she had like one tenth of one percent or something like that. And uh, nothing, you know, not enough uh, really to uh, consider herself even part uh, a tribal person. So and so she ends up having to admit that she's not. And the point I'm trying to make here is that the left always bluffs. The left is always going to come at, at as conservative and at people making bold statements. And they want you to think that they have information that um, you don't, that uh, they want you to be therefore intimidated. You'll be sh you'll shut up. You'll be silent about it because that's what uh, Senator Warren was hoping for. That when she makes a statement that she's got tribal blood in her, she didn't think any Republican would dare to come out and challenge her on it, you know. And uh, because in a way, you would think you're taking a risk. If she comes out and pr produces proof, then you've got to eat your words. And it's not very good for your political career. However, uh, you got to remember with the left, they're always bluffing. For you and I, we don't have a political career to, um, to worry about. So if we have one of our relatives, friends, coworkers, or whatever coming up and making bold statements like that, uh, feel free to say, to pr challenge them, prove it. Really, you're, you've got tribal blood, so you've got proof of that. You've got uh, a DNA report that shows that. Can I see it? That type of thing. Because they're always bluffing. Elizabeth Warren was bluffing, and uh, as are most uh, socialists. And what they're looking to do is to cow their uh, cow re re Republicans or conservatives, get you to be intimidated and keep your mouth shut. Stand your ground, ask for proof, and eventually what happened was she started, she went from using being 
a very uh, speaking in figurative terms. I think she was trying to be imaginary about the whole thing, psychologistic, and by Trump holding his ground and insisting, uh, mocking her and calling her uh, Pocahontas. She eventually got to the point where she knew she had to produce some proof. That's when the conversation gets to the intellectual stage, the rational stage, and that's where uh, we have an advantage, and the left does not. So, um, so, so today I'm going to be talking or reading from the uh, Ayn Rand lexicon, and um, let's see here, and also from the um, uh, from Saul Alinsky, the. 13 Rules for Radicals, and also defeating Alinsky when I come back. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And um, so uh, today's concept, the concept of the day is duty. From the Ayn Rand lexicon. Duty, one of the most destructive anti-concepts in the history of moral philosophy is the term duty. An anti-concept is an artificial, unnecessary, and rationally unusable term designed to replace and obliterate some legitimate concept. The term duty obliterates more than single concepts. It is a metaphysical and psychological killer. It negates all the essentials of a rational view of life and makes them inapplicable to man's actions. The meaning of the term duty is the moral necessity to perform certain actions for no reason other than obedience to some higher authority without regard to any personal goal, motive, desire, or interest. It is obvious that um, that, that anti-concept is a product of mysticism, not an abstraction derived from reality. It is a mystic theory of ethics. Duty stands for the notion that man must obey the dictates of a supernatural authority, even though the anti-concept has been secularized and the authority of God's will has been ascribed to earthly entities such as parents, country, state, mankind, etc. Their Their alleged supremacy still rests on nothing but a mystic edict. Who in hell can have the right to claim that sort of submission or obedience? This is the only proper form and locality for the question because nothing and no one can have such a right or claim here on earth. The arch-advocate of duty is Immanuel Kant. He went so much farther than other theorists that they seem innocently benevolent by comparison. Duty, he holds, is the only standard of virtue, but virtue is not its own reward. If a reward is involved, it is no longer virtue. The only moral motivation, he holds, is devotion to duty for duty's sake. Only an action motivated exclusively by such devotion is a moral action. If one were to accept it, the anti-concept of duty destroys the concept of reality. An unaccountable supernatural power takes precedence over facts and dictates one's actions regardless of context or consequences. Duty destroys reason. It supersedes one's knowledge and judgment, making the process of thinking and judging irrelevant to one's actions. Duty destroys values. It demands that one betray or sacrifice one's highest values for the sake of an inexplicable command, and it transforms values into a threat to one's moral worth. Since the experience of pleasure or desire casts doubt on the moral purity of one's motives. Duty destroys love. Who could want to be loved not from inclination, but from duty? Duty destroys self-esteem. It leaves no self to be esteemed. If one accepts that nightmare in the name of morality, the infernal irony is that duty destroys morality. A deontological duty center theory of ethics confines moral principles to a list of prescribed duties and leaves the rest of man's life without any moral guidance, cutting morality off from any application to the actual problems and concerns of man's existence. Such matters as work, career, ambition, love, friendship, pleasure, happiness, values, insofar as they are not pursued as duties, are regarded by these theories as amoral, i.e. outside the province of morality. If so, then by what standard is a man to make his daily choices or direct the course of his life? In a deontological theory, all personal desires are banished from the realm of morality. 
A personal desire has no moral significance, be it a desire to create or a desire to kill. For example, if a man is not supporting his life from duty, such a morality makes no distinction between supporting it by honest labor or by robbery. If a man wants to be honest, he deserves no moral credit, as Kant would put it. Such honesty is praiseworthy, but without moral import. Only a vicious repressor, who feels a profound desire to lie, cheat, and steal, but forces himself to act honestly for the sake of duty, would receive a recognition of moral worth from Kant and his ilk. This is the sort of theory that gives morality a bad name. And uh, let's see. It goes on, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, leave it there. And um, there isn't much talk uh, these days about duty other than, I think, on the left. The uh, left has more of a tendency to talk about um, having duties, uh, duties to the earth and uh, duties to uh, mankind or to human beings in general, that kind of thing. And you don't generally hear it on the right, at least not as much as you used to hear it. Your duties to um, vote, to be a good citizen, to um, uh, join the military, that kind of thing, to participate in the draft if it comes up, those, uh, those kinds of duties. So when I come back, I'm going to be reading from The uh, 13 Rules for Radicals by Saul Alinsky. And thank you very much. And uh, I'm reading from the uh, 13 rules. Let me see here. Let me check. Uh, what is it called? 13 Tactics for Realistic Radicals and uh, by Saul Alinsky. So let's get this back open. Okay, so there's a section here that was called, let's see, what was it called? Competition. And it really is irrelevant to what the points I'm trying to make. So I'm going to go ahead and skip it and go on to this section called their own petard. And a petard is a like a bomb or a grenade type of thing, because there's a saying called hoisted by your own petard, which basically means blown up by your own bomb or blown up by your own grenade. The basic tenet, uh, tactic in warfare against the haves, because he's been talking about the haves and the have-nots, is a mass political jujitsu. The have-nots do not rigidly oppose the haves, but yield in such planned and skilled ways that the superior strength of the haves becomes their own undoing. For example, since the haves publicly pose as the custodians of responsibility, morality, law, and justice, which are frequently strangers to each other, they can be constantly pushed to live up to their own book of morality and regulations. No organization, including organized religion, can live up to the letter of its own book. Now, what I was going to want to say here is that you hear this from the left constantly, for, and usually you're going to hear this in terms of religious. If you're a conservative and you're a Christian, and uh, you're going to, you go out and you judge somebody, hey, that person is uh, doing something that's immoral or unethical, then very often you're going to hear from the left, uh, the, the lefties among, uh, that are, say, in your workplace or your friends or relatives or neighbors, they're going to say, well, wait a minute, uh, you're a Christian, aren't you supposed to forgive? Aren't you supposed to be um, uh, not judging people? Isn't that uh, one of the commandments or whatever? And what's going on here is that, first of all, the left, when you're talking about socialists, are atheists, period. Uh, they don't believe in God. So the, the issue then becomes, do I, do I take religious lessons from somebody that's an atheist? Do I listen to somebody tell me how to be a better Christian that's an atheist? No, I don't. The other part of this is that what they're sort of doing is trying to position themselves, they're using the Socratic method, which means they're trying to pretend that they're neutral. And, and the way they win in this particular argument is if you allow them to be neutral. So one of the tactics that you can use, first of all, you can tell them, hey, I don't take Christianity lessons from atheists, but thanks anyways. Another way is um, to go ahead and uh, get them to state their position. Okay, so what should I do then? Right? So if they say, well, I thought uh, the Christians are not supposed to judge. So what should I do instead? And get them to stake out their position. Or, uh, so are you a Christian? Ask them that. 
and then uh, they again, if they are are Christian, then you can perhaps have a discussion with them about what it is that constitutes Christianity. But more than likely, they're not. They may pretend to be, but more than likely, they're not. And when, when they aren't, and they say, "Well, no," as a matter of fact, I'm not. The, and they may decide that to say they're spiritual, which just is another way of saying atheist, or I'm a Buddhist, atheist, uh, Taoist, uh, atheist, as far as I'm concerned. So, um, you, and then you, or you may have run into people that are Jewish, but they don't apostates, people that maybe have been um, well, with Jewish people that happen. So does it, it does with. Christians, Catholics, and Protestants that were baptized but no longer go to church. They don't go to church. They don't read the Bible. They don't study the Bible. They don't pray. Okay, and those are usually the ones that consider themselves spiritual. So if you get them to come out and say, "Well, no, I'm spiritual," or um, you know something of that nature, then you can again come back and tell them, "Look, uh, I'm not going to take Christianity lessons uh, or worshiping lessons." from an atheist or from somebody that's not Christian. Thank you anyways. And you can stop that right dead in its tracks. So the, again, most of the tactics that the left uses depends on the cooperation of the person they're trying to use his tactics on, usually a conservatives. So if you allow them, they will win if you allow them to win. If you simply stand your ground, realize who you're dealing with, then uh, there's no way you can lose. No way. Okay, let's see. So that's, again, that's the, what he's talking about when he says hold them up to their own standards. And see, the other thing is sometimes not just with Christianity, but if you come out and say, well, so-and-so is a bad driver. Boy, they really stink. They're a really lousy driver. The lefty will come to you and say, well, what about the time you did X, Y, Z? Best, best way to deal with that is with a question. You say, and? What does that prove? Or, so what? Because the whole idea is they want to intimidate you. Don't let them do it. And the way you don't let them do it is to try to get the conversation onto a rational, reasonable terms. So if they have uh, proof or they, they can put, to, put the situation together, say, well, uh, you drove bad last week, so you shouldn't be... Uh, complaining about somebody else driving bad now we're starting to have a conversation they're still wrong it's bad logic but at least now the conversation is going our way okay and when we have the conversation going our way we can't lose the worst thing that can happen is if you're dealing with somebody that is a lefty and you get them to be rational be reasonable is that they will be able to prove their point at which point, all you have to do is say, you know what? You're right. I was wrong. I learned something today. Thank you very much. But that's not what they want to do. They don't want to educate anybody. They want to exercise power. They want to operate with impunity. They want to bully and intimidate. So uh, back to the book. You can club them to death with their book of rules and regulations. That is what the great, that great revolutionary Paul of Tarsus knew when he wrote to the Corinthians, quote, "...who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth." Unquote. Let us take, for example, the case of the civil rights demonstrations of 1963 in Birmingham when thousands of Negro children stayed out of school to participate in the street demonstrations." The Birmingham Board of Education dusted off its book of regulations and threatened to expel all children absent for this reason. Here, the civil rights leaders erred, as they did on other vital tactics, by backing off instead of rushing in with more demonstrations and pressing the Birmingham Board of Education between the pages of their book of regulations by forcing them to live up to the letter of their regulations and statements. The board in the city of Birmingham would have been in a, an impossible situation with every Negro child expelled and loose on the streets if they didn't reverse themselves before they acted. They would have reversed themselves one day later. Well, not necessarily. First of all, you're assuming that the children that get expelled would have then uh, gone ahead and uh, been on the streets. No, they wouldn't. They would have been at home, and mom and dad would have been picking up their education, would have been educating these kids. So uh, the other part of this is that where it's a bad example is 
the left is trying to revolutionize the entire world, uh, not just the South. And what the tactics and whatnot that were used by the ta- this, the by people, by protesters and activists and whatnot in the South in the 1960s were valid because they were righteous. What was going on to black people in the 1960s in the South and other places in this country was wrong. Okay, it wasn't an issue of power. It was an issue of right and wrong. Is it right to take some citizens and treat them as though they don't exist or don't matter? No, no, it doesn't. It's not right. It's it's wrong and it needs to be corrected. And people need to know that that is wrong. And uh, if they know that it's wrong, they'll stop doing it and they won't do it ever again. That's the important thing is that in this particular example that he's setting the activists the how does he refer to them um demonstrators let's call that the case of civil rights demonstrations um demonstrators uh were righteous they had cause they had reason to demonstrate they had reason to take these actions to keep uh, children out of schools because they wanted the schools to be Uh, desegregated because that was only right. It's not right to be treating, again, some citizens as though they don't count or don't matter. So um, back to the book. Another dramatic failure to understand tactics came to came during the second Chicago public school boycott. In 1964, a struggle against a de facto segregated public school system. We know that the efficacy of any action is in the reaction it evokes from the haves. So that cycle escalates in a continuum of conflict. Lacking any reaction from the haves, except public notice of the numbers of children involved, effects of the boycott were significantly over by the next day. This boycott was what I call a terminal tactic, one that crests, breaks, and disappears like a wave. Terminal tactics do not arouse the reaction that is essential for the development of a conflict. A terminal tactic is to be exercised only to finish a conflict for it is ineffective in the development of the rhythm of give and take that one must have while stepping up the war and building the movement. Civil rights leaders could console themselves with the psychological carryovers, public display of support, and similar prayerful hopes. But as for carrying on the conflict for integration, that was over and done with by the next day. Nice memory. In Chicago, the haves slipped badly when both a judge and a district attorney muttered that the Book of Regulations banned attempts to induce the absence of public school students and growled ominously about an injunction against all civil rights leaders taking part in the development of the boycott. Here, as always, whenever the haves start living by their book, they present a golden opportunity to the have-nots to transform what have had been a terminal tactic into a sweeping advance on many fronts. The children wouldn't need to be absent. The leaders would only would be the only people who needed to act. Now was the time to start an intensive campaign of ridicule, insults, and taunting defiance, daring the district attorney and the judge either to live up to the regulations and issue the injunctions or stand publicly exposed as fearful frauds who were afraid to put the law where their mouths were. Such behavior on the part of the have-nots would probably have resulted in the injunction, but By this time, the boycott tactic would have been shaking, would have had shaking consequences. Immediately following the boycott, every civil rights leader in the city of Chicago involved in it would have been in violation of the court injunction. But the last thing that the establishment wants is to indict and imprison every single civil rights leader, which would have included leaders of every religious organization in town in the city of Chicago. Such a step would have shaken the power structure of Chicago and certainly put the entire issue of school segregation policy on the line. Without any question, the district attorney and the judge would have had to depend on postponements in the hope that everybody just forget about it. At this point, now that uh, the civil rights leaders had the powerful weapon of the Book of Laws uh, of the haves, they would have to stand fast publicly. Uh, Once again, taunting, insulting, demanding that the judge and the district attorney obey the law, charging that the district attorney and the courts had issued an injunction which they had publicly, willfully, and maliciously violated, that they, uh, they therefore must be compelled to pay the penalties for this action. If the civil rights leaders insisted that they be arrested and tried, the haves would be on the run and in complete confusion, caught in the straitjacket of their own book. 
Enforcement of their injunction would have resulted in a citywide storm of protest and a rapid growth in the organization. Non-enforcement would have singled a breakdown and retreat of the haves from the have-nots and also resulted in the swelling, the size, and force of the have-not organization. But again, the whole problem with all of this is that the situation he is describing and using as an, as an example is not a situation of power. It's an issue of right and wrong. There are uh, people that were right that want the, uh, the, the and they were right to have the school system integrated and have children have the equal uh, equal access to um, educational resources. And the people that stand in that in the way of that are wrong. In this particular case, city attorney, district attorney, judges, anybody who stands in the way of um, what is right is wrong. So you don't need, and he's looking at everything again in terms of power, tactics, and strategy. It it didn't work in this particular case because it wasn't necessary. They made the point that the district attorney and the judge were wrong. It's like there was a the Chicago 7. They were put on trial in 1967 for starting, trying to start a... Um, uh, I think they were accused of starting, trying to start a riot or, or encouraging riots, that type of thing. And there was one individual of the seven, a black guy that was um, speaking out during the trial. The judge kept at telling him to, to be quiet. He wouldn't do it. So the judge had him uh, tied to his chair and had his mouth duct taped. And it was a it was a really it was really bad. I mean, it was just a horrible uh, situation where. Again, the judge, but it was bad because the judge erred. He was wrong in doing it. Not because it was a bad tactics or a bad strategy, but because uh, the better way to have done it was simply in what they do today is if you're making outbursts in court, you're removed from the court and you get to view the proceedings on a television. You get you put in, the, in a holding cell somewhere and you watch it on TV. And you only get to go back in court when you can behave yourself. So that would be would have been the way to do it. Simply remove him from the courtroom, have him view the proceedings on a television or have uh, somebody uh, uh, or radio or something of that nature. And uh, instead, uh, they just uh, when they they screwed up. The judge went ahead and screwed up and uh, um, did wrong by this uh, particular defendant. So. Um, anyway, so uh, that uh, brings us to the conclusion of that particular uh, section. And uh, when I come back, um, now, as a matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up right here. We'll we'll do the uh, the next one, um, the uh, rules for radicals defeated. I'll I'll do tomorrow. So um, again, that brings us to the conclusion of another episode of the drill. And until next time, thank you for listening, and have a great day.